Hello, hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Graves, and you are watching Tone Deaf, the show where I talk about my experiences and insights in the music industry. Today, I'll be continuing my Artist to Artist series and chatting with one of my favorite people and longtime collaborator, Christian Wiesenberg. You probably know him as one half of the German electro project Rotorsan, but Christian also works as a solo artist under the moniker Wiesenberg, as well as being an active member of the artist collective Home Wreckers. Behind the scenes, he's a prolific producer, mastering engineer, sound engineer, as well as being one of the most thoughtful and artistic minds that I know. Everyone, I present to you Chris John Wiesenberg. Hi, Chris John. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. How you doing? Thank you for coming on my uh, my little show thing if it's a show i don't know if it's a show but it, i'll it's call kind it a of show. a show kind of if you're in it it's kind of a show <laughs> yeah that's why i'm wearing like the brightest most peacocky shirt yeah, that i possibly and can i'm trying just to blend in into this whole dark goth cliche ish thing with wearing black and some beanie because my hair my hair isn't shaved properly at the moment well that's why i'm wearing the hat but yeah you're you're, you're certainly doing the the brooding artist thing yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm trying to get the Rick Rubin style beard, so I'm, I, I look more more than a really successful producer than just a pro prolific. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> I'm be sorry, both. I haven't talked English for for more than a minute for quite some time. So sometimes I need to think for the right words or even oh, talk stupid bull. Oh, that I believe me. I know. I'm still doing the whole uh, German tutoring thing and uh if i even go a couple of days without speaking german i just start saying words that sound like they're right and they just mean you know absolutely the the completely wrong thing so i yeah. i i can't even imagine how hard it would be to try to like express complicated sort of philosophic artistic ideas in a foreign language <laughs> yeah it, it, i guess it will work out so the memory about the terms will will fall back while we speak it's usually like that with me do you think that that's like was it always easy for you or do you have to i don't know get get used to talking about this kind of stuff in english um it it was easy for me as as i toured a lot with uh, vnv nation and 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 Nights of rap which are obviously english speaking guys um, um so you kind of get used to it and and at one point, I guess, whatever, might be 10, 12 years ago, I had the first time something like waking up in a, in a nightliner in the US and, and realized that I have actually dreamt in English. Oh. And, and so that, and that was kind of a point where I started to get kind of self-confident about talking in English because I thought like, okay, that's not something I'm, where I'm not translating my thoughts into a foreign language, but they're already thinking in it. Yeah. So So I'm usually hoping that I get back to it while I talk. So yeah, yeah, it's it's like you. I was actually telling my tutor on Monday that it's it feels like an engine. Like I have to like warm it up. If I just yeah. like roll out of bed and I have to speak anything in German, it just it just doesn't happen. No, no, you you, you need some time to to switch the mode a bit or something, just to get used to it and then get the reflexes going. You just need this little one cognitive jump. Yeah, or, or going over that cliff, and then once you're in that foreign language water, you get kind of safer in it. Yeah, and it's the same with the thoughts about artistic things or sophisticated artistic things or something uh, itself. You just once you're getting into thinking about it, then it starts to roll out. That doesn't still doesn't mean necessarily that it makes sense at all, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. but but once you're in it, 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 it opens up a little bit, like 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 a book or something, like yeah. a folded book. I don't know what the term is. The, these books where then fold up houses or something come oh, out. Oh, a pop up a pop up book. Pop up books, yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, I it's kind of like my goal, right? Like if, if there was anything that I really wanted to be able to do with my German, it's like, you know, hopefully in the next couple of years, I'll be able to have conversations like these, you know, in German with you on your podcast or your show. <laughs> the, the good thing about English is that it's more like an international language. So you got a br bigger audience yeah. while talking in English. And then for me, it's kind of good because in English, everything th sounds a little bit more intellectual in a way, at least to my ears. But the in German, German, the words are bigger. Yeah, the words are bigger, and, and German in itself sounds very scientific always, because it's got all this, whatever, harsher transients in the consonants and all that yeah. stuff. Like, 
but it got another melody and rhythm to it. So everything in German so sounds more like Excel compared to Word or something. <laughs> if you put it in software, it's more yeah. like a very structured, massive language or something, I would say. Yeah. But see, the, 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 the thing with English being like the more uh, wider spoken language is the fact that you have like more competition, right? There's more like podcasts and shows and every everybody like me is trying to have their own kind of show or podcast right now. But I think, I think in German, there's l less options and there's maybe more, more, more market to corner there. Yeah, likely, mm. but still you don't have that much people that talk German all over the world. And especially with, with English, if it's not very super sophisticated, um, um, you kind of get away kind of easy with a very limited amount of words. Sure. You no, know, it's like whatever there's this thing about um, uh, if you talk business English with other people, so you, you got two non-native speakers talking to each other that you get away with with a set of 8,000 words or something. <laughs> yeah. There's even this word for it for like globish. So if you talk to whatever example, Japanese guy, and your English is much better than his, then it's kind of a problem. So yeah. actually, business people try to hold back the quality of their English just to not offend. <laughs> yeah. But okay, with with Japanese, this offending and and thing is it's kind of huge anyway. But I think this English thing, it's what people are more used to by TV shows, movies, sure. uh, and of course pop music. Yeah. Just, just because, like, I guess I keep telling my wife that I want to, uh, since since a, a German speaking American is is not uh, is, is super common over here. I'm just always kind of like, I wonder if I can get on, like, you know, uh, on on those shows like uh, Schlag den Star or you know, just all these like really or, or the Voice of Germany or something. <laughs> yeah voice of germany in itself is english so it doesn't necessarily mean voice in german <laughs> or something yeah but, but like all that you could be like a judge on something like ah, that. Okay, yeah, that you know what i mean no yeah, yeah. It, then 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 there's just like less less people to choose from and then maybe they'll be like oh let's take that weird american guy with the floral shirts who never buttons them up because he speaks german and yeah and, and of course it's more fancy it's like you're more fancy if you're coming from somewhere else but trying to blend in so you always got this kind of a sweet accent <laughs> if, if, if you want to call it sweet yes yeah you can call it thick too doesn't matter. when i took the yes most a lot of people came up to me and were thinking i'm brazilian why ever due to my accent um the, and i thought like okay my, my accent i don't know i can judge it because it's yours um and i never i never met a brazilian who talked english to me so <laughs> <laughs> Maybe what's more about Brazilian waxing actually instead uh, instead of ac accents, but I don't know. I, all these things are actually well out of my like scope of professional understanding w waxing and <laughs> accents. So <laughs> I guess I guess let's talk about things we are actually pretty good at, which is uh, I think uh, being artists and. Uh, we have these kinds of discussions pretty often, like through Facebook messenger, I think just for all the people who are watching this, um, mm -hmm. uh, Christian and I have been working together since 2008 when, uh, he produced a violent emotion and then, oh, he, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you produced, uh, all beauty destroyed in 2011. And then, uh, since then you've basically just been my go-to mastering engineer and uh the guy i always ask for feedback on every single one of my mixes yep yeah that's kind of true it's been a long <laughs> way baby <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um okay I, I i wasn't aware that um uh, all beauty destroyed was three years after violent emotion oh i thought it was kind of closer no Together. that was that was my sort of yearly uh, cycle, it seems. So it's like I did my first record in 2005 and then A Violent Emotion came out in 2008 and then I'll Be You Destroyed in 2011 and then actually yeah. Till Death was 2014. Ah, oh, okay. I wasn't aware of that. And I, and I thought back at that day, so there was kind of a back and forth with Necessary Response or something. Wasn't yeah. it? In, was it before that? Uh, necessary Response, the, that album came out in 2007. 
So, oh, okay. and the reason that that one came together so quickly was because like most of the songs had already been written for my first, uh, for my debut album. But you know, ah. my, my record label at the time was like, no, you, you, you can't do that. None of those songs can be on, on, uh, on your, your, on your record because we, you're, you're, you're like Hosiko, right? Like you can't be, you can't be like Hosiko and V and V nation at the same time. <laughs> I think they told me something like, I yeah. think it was pretty much like that. Really, they were like, yeah, you can't be V and V and conception of purity. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that's not really so much of a thing anymore. I feel like no. I feel like people are being a little bit more open minded these days. Yes, definitely, and, and I guess the whole idea of um, being super consequent and, and and consistent in your sound starts to bore when you're when you're listening to kind of spotify or something so yeah no one's i guess close to no one is listening to full artist albums that got a consequently and very stringent kind of sound to yeah. it um i guess that's perfectly done it, it might be also connected to the kind of, of of age in our peer groups or something that they aren't 20 usually or 18 or something um um that, that they have heard enough Hosiko records or something that the next Hosiko record um, should be a bit different in some parts at least. Yeah. I mean, for me, yeah, it, I, was, I, it was, it was, it was never that way. Actually. I, I remember when a violent emotion came out, there were people that were like writing me or, you know, commenting on the, very early versions of Facebook and whatever, like, oh, yeah, this is just a pop record. This is, you know, you used to be good and now you went pop. It's like with a violent emotion. So I was like, yeah. okay. I mean, interesting. So I, th there was even, even then um, there was this kind of idea of, a ba of, of purity. I think, I think sort of like goth scene fans are a little bit better than like metal fans. Cause metal fans are really yeah. just like, if it's not metal, I hate it. Um, but still you you have these like weird notions of of purity that exist in this scene and it's like if you if you ever try to make any kind of pivot or turn in what it is that you're doing you, your fans get really really upset and i don't know when that happened because i remember when i was growing up like there were bands that had all different kinds of sounds you know it's just like taking one of the biggest examples like skinny puppy it was like yeah. skinny puppy did not sound the same from beginning to end you know no no and i had this actually um um the other way around when i got into the goss thing i think about whatever 2003 or something and it was the first rotter than on um a wave gothic traffic in 2004 um and we played there, and, and, and I, I've never played a goth festival before. Actually, I haven't ever been to a goth festival before. Really? No. No, 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 no. I, I came from a whatever kind of <clears throat> techno background. Yeah. Um, and, and haven't done that much music for two years before that, uh, before I came into Rotas. And, and, and then I was on this, we've got this thing, we play Parkbühne, like the outside stage. Mm -hmm. And before I played, I don't know who it was actually. I guess it was Cyber Axis or something. That's more kind of an industrial metal, guitarish, whatever. Yeah. Um, um, we got to sound like Americans, but we do, we aren't a yeah. thing. And after I played some of those medieval things. Oh yes. And I was like, okay, peeps, that's super weird. Um, I, I'm used. I was used to whatever Nature One or, or techno festivals where yeah. I played, in whatever in the late '90s or something. It was like, okay, I'm I'm used to the thing that the music coming from stage or actually is played is being kind of consistent. It's kind right. of pure. It's kind of the same. It's about the flow or something. And the audience is kind of colorful and different because you got hippies in there and 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 whatever all that raving people. Yeah. People. Who, who liked electronic music and some esoteric people who just like to dance and whatever, the drug people, all the, all the things you got in a techno thing. And I was like, okay, and, and here it's completely the other way around. Like the whole audience is dressed in black and they look kind of similar to me when I look from stage. Yeah. And the music on the stage is different from band to band. I don't see a connection between Rotterdam and, and, and the medieval Celtic something band. 
Yeah, that, that was kind of a shocking thing to mm. me, and and I think it's still kind of a subcultural phenomena. I guess it's even stronger in the U.S. than over here in Europe. That, that being a goth, put it in that word, um, is much more part of your identity than it is over here. It's yeah. like if you live on the countryside in the U.S. or something, and you and you are a, and you are a goth. I guess you're mainly alone or you got two or three people in in your town little town village or something so so being a goth costs you a bit of social credit or something like that right so it sets you more apart while when you're living in kind of hyper urbanized nation like germany or something where this whole idea of of gothic industrial or something was big all the time especially here in the rural area where i live um it, it's part of a normal idea to be a goth or, or be a metal guy or be a hip-hop guy or something they're, they're all kind of blending in here at schools so you're not that special because there isn't there, there was no one interested in being uh, i'm the normal pop mainstream guy because there's no right. identity in it but it was still just sort of like the dark music scene was just another sort of subculture option and yeah. wasn't any weirder than being into hip-hop or metal or no not at all. It's it's like the same thing. So it's just got some different topics, of course. Yeah. No, um, t totally. And and I guess then as an artist, especially as someone, you got to kind of focus on your per on you as person. It's, I guess for Rotterdam, it's much more Rascal's part in it. Something to 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 be f to be the point of focus w with the identity of people or something. Um, of course, then then they expect you to be something even musically that they can trust yeah so and and, and they don't accept changes because they don't expect it or something because because you've always been there so people want that kind of security and home or something yeah. to it and i guess of course it, as your band grows you're, you're taking more the risk that with every little twitch you do to the music you you lose some people and yeah. of course then you get the standard phenomena of the how oh, the old records are pretty good but the new stuff sucks because people want to explain that that they know you much longer than everyone else so they keep the ex exclusivity like like in the ownership of knowing yeah. you or something that's it's always been kind of an underground phenomena to to just to be more exclusive or, or to be a more expert or more whatever yeah. more special than the others that's why subcultures usually tend to split up into even smaller sub subcultures. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's true, but I feel like maybe this trend has s somehow gotten worse in the last 20 or so years because, you know, like I said, when I was growing up, there was a lot of different kinds of sounds involved with this, you know, scene, at least in America, you had Skinny Puppy and and thrill kill cult and you know bands that were just like oh yeah we're industrial but we play with techno we play with metal we play with you know disco whatever but <laughs> but you know <laughs> like I did. <laughs> yeah i mean they they had like a surf rock record which is horrible but you know at least they tried <laughs> yeah it's like snock who got this halfway country records yeah you know. And I, you know, I, I appreciate this, this, this artistic experimentation, but it just feels kind of like maybe in the last few years that things have gotten uh, homogenized and the sort of like the danger and the experimentation has kind of left it. And maybe it is because like you said, you know, people sort of view their music as, as some kind of safe place. It's home, right? And when home yep. changes, that's scary. Yep. It's something like that. And especially... Not that I'm about to blame social media at that point too much. Um, but of course, with social media, you always find someone who thinks like you. Because mm -hmm. every even smallest fraction of, of fans or people, even you got the same thing with political views. They, they find a bunch of people who think, who think the same way. And, and so they feel that they're part of the community. And it even got this idea of a fake idea of a majority about things so yeah. if, if you got a whatever an aesthetic perfection threat and someone is starting to blame you because your last record sucks because it's too i don't know red blue yellow or smells of fish or whatever 
um, um, then he finds people or things the same. And, 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 and so you got a threat going, which doesn't mean anything about is, is it a majority or is it you now just a thing of people who found themselves being in there? Um, and it all gets a bit wishy-washy with, with when it comes to quality and quantity or something of it. Yeah. But then, but then you have sort of people that don't really want, like you, you sort of cr breed artists that don't want to take risks, which is kind of, yeah, of course. which is kind of counter counterintuitive because, you know, the thing that drew you to, you know, your favorite artist when you were a kid or whatever kind of music you got into is like, because it was different, right? You felt like, oh shit, my parents are going to hate this. I love it. Right. Like there's some yeah, element uh, of difference to it. Right. Yeah. 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 There is. Um, Yeah, but I guess this whole idea of um, um, rebellion when you are 14 or something up it, is a bit gone because you can't shock um, parents anymore too much. It, it was even a thing with me that I was, it was hard for me, not that I actively tried, but I guess it was obviously kind of an instinctive theme when you're in that, is it pubertarian age or whatever it's called? <laughs> Pubescent. Pubescent, okay. It's a very gross sounding word. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds it sounds not nice. But if you're in that phase of your development, of course you want to shock your parents in a way because you need to find your own identity and usually you need to fight against something at that age because your hormones are getting wild and stuff like that. So so even for me, it was hard to find something that, that especially my father hated because he had a bunch of whatever, Velvet, Velvet Underground, Nick Cave Records, um, okay. Miles Davis, uh, Beatles, of course, the standard stuff. Um, and it was pretty weird to to find something that, that, he, that he really didn't like or that he didn't find any kind of, oh, okay, I didn't like it, but it's okay. Right. The, if he wasn't an artistic guy. So um, it was kind of weird. So I was kind of happy that, that, that this whole techno thing started off in the mid and eighties that, that totally threw away any idea of, of musicality and pop at the moment. So right. that gave me some space and, and even the idea of being a DJ, which was my first thing into music after playing drums, um, um, was something that was shocking enough for, for my parents because it was so different from traditional idea of, of making music or, or doing something with music professionally because mm -hmm. it totally went away from the idea of an instrument and in creation because it was more about the whole idea of blending creating a long flow and all that stuff interesting so is it is it more about like just is it about f f feeling or i i guess i've never really personally understood that world is so it's it's about creating a flow and a f feeling it's the, the act of DJing is it's like creating a flow at least it was whatever when we started it I started DJing in clubs in 1992 which is a long time ago but the music in general like creating it and you know the sort it, of philosophy behind the music itself it, it's more like a flow especially when when the techno thing started like not the house thing that was always a bit different because it had so much connection to disco um, um, but, but the whole techno thing had a bit of this anti-pop idea Mm -hmm. Like you don't need a stage because we really hated this. Um, it sounds very harsh, to be honest. Um, we hated this um, authoritarian idea of a stage. Okay. Because obviously, if there's a stage, it's like in school. There's someone in front and there's an audience. And obviously, there's an hierarchy in it. It's not just because the stage is higher, but you're alone. Yeah. And, and they got a collective. So you always got a one-to-many communicational thing. And, and obviously, you got a thing of authority over it or a power or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it that, that's feeding your narcissistic ego which is totally fine it's a normal thing but i guess you know it yourself so so there are moments you put in a come on and it and it reflects yeah it kind of give you feedback and and whatever uh, joey starting <laughs> to whatever cross his drumsticks um and people start clapping so so you got a kind of an power over it and the whole thing for me at least with this dj position was something that, that, that this is a kind of a different position because you are not actively part of it. So back in those days, in, in the mid-90s or something, clubs 
weren't designed as they are today. Like, like the DJ booth is kind of a prominent place. Yeah. So they were usually there as old dance clubs or something, like like whatever in the sixties or something built. So so the DJ was in a corner, maybe sometimes even in a kind of separated room. So you look through a glass window on, on yeah. the dance floor. So he wasn't actively part of it. So he was just there and and more like not putting direct power in it to get right. feedback, like not come on, clap your hands and now scream or something. Then he was just nudging it by, by the flow and the music in itself and trying to create a a longer flow with ha without having this direct and personal an artistic response to it. Mm -hmm. So it's like a it's more like a purified idea of a long building up life thing. Yeah. And, and that was something I, I thought was really fascinating. It was really fascinating to 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 create an, an long, like whatever, one and a half, two hour running flow building up to something and 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 doing it with kind of really small build up ideas like like the difference between the tracks were of, of course rather small um and that was something i always thought kind of magic because if it was well done by djs um it really got to the point where, where you lost control over the music not in a two or three minute thing but but the music took so much power that 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 screaming thing you know from primetime breaks or something <laughs> was wasn't kind of a thing of an um ecstatic moments or more like a relief because you yeah. couldn't stand the pressure and that was always something I, I found super magic in this whole techno thing that that it built it up another form of of energy compared yeah. to a three minute or four minute pop track or something which is more still acting on a pop thing because you recognize the track and then it works and, and back in these old days like like obviously no one bought techno records to listen to them at home it was <laughs> stupid idea why no one did it that came up later a little bit so so all the music that was played in the club wasn't known by the audience it was just being there to to create this kind of collective vibe to it yeah so it's it just very, about this experience with you know a group of people and then it's and then it's over it's this very sort of ephemeral thing right yeah 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 and it was very kind of I wouldn't say democratic, but um, it was a bit of this thing like everyone was kind of on the same level. Yeah. Or something, because no one knew the music, there were no experts in the audience, of course. It's yeah. like today you have, like you, like you told us, all this expert, like, oh, aesthetic perfection doesn't sound like aesthetic perfection anymore. He has lost his whatever anger <laughs> and, and and he lost everything I liked over him and so I don't like him anymore but I still buy his music why because I don't know yeah and yeah there was there was nothing of it it was just okay there's a beat there's a flow and and you get into it or you're not going to get into it there's nothing recognizable yeah. in it that's that's, that's really a really romantic view on techno it uh, yes, it is very romantic. I'm sold. I think I want to start going to some techno clubs when the world reopens. Yeah, yeah, definitely. To um, be part of this collective experience. It was it, it was it was really magic. At some point it was really magic. I still remember some early days before I started DJing, like nineteen ninety or something, some clubs that were so foggy and so full of smoke, of course. Um, um that there was just a wall of smoke and, and some lights. Like like of course if you put on normal wash par lights or something back in those days the the whole room seems to be in one color and you couldn't see the other people dancing okay it was kind of it was kind of really forming me still in a kind of flow that, that i think it's a very introversive idea to to listen to techno and i still think it's a super emotional music because because it it neglects a kind of a formalism that that pop music has mm -hmm. And, and and just brings it back to an to an feedback loop even while you make it right there's a lot of them even the first tracks we did on whatever felix the house cuts radical fear label or something were kind of arranged live so why we mm -hmm. did them mm -hmm. so they were like really sessions cut and that's it because because we didn't think about a formalistic idea of arrangement or something so so we just 
got into the flow that we would have gone to as, as dancers back at those days um, while making it. Well, it sounds a bit weird if you haven't done it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't done it, but now I'm sold on it. I think it's, I think it's cool because it, it, it really seems like it's this uh, almost like a tribal experience, right? Where it's, it's where it's it's not even really about the 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 music at all. It's just the the mood and the experience, and you know, and then it's gone. You can't recreate yep. it at home. No, because it's kind of it's more as I would say that there's some magic in pop music or something, or even yeah. kind of some alchemy in it. I would say that that in techno, there's a lot of shamanistic things. Yeah, yeah. It's like things just growing and evolving and and interacting with yourself, and and once you you start to get into into a formalistic idea like, oh, now there's, there's a hook line missing or something, then, then actually you, you're gone out of, of the flow. Right. So then so then you go from this world to Wave Gothic Treffen, where it's essentially a fashion <laughs> show for egos. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't put it that hard, but um, partly it is. Oh, come on. <laughs> it just, I remember my first time actually at Wave Gothic was also 2004. And oh. yeah, so I, I came with my, with my, with my demo and my American label guy, and we were trying to get me signed. <laughs> wow. So I, I, I came all the way to Germany to try and get myself a record contract. And, uh, <laughs> cause that's what you did in 2004, I guess. Um, and I just remember being there like, this is great. Just like at, you know, Agra, which is the main sort of, uh, yeah. Uh, area there for the people who don't who don't know it. Um, it's where the market is. It's where the biggest uh, uh, concert hall is, and you can just sit there and people watch. And ju- it, it, it's just you're guaranteed to be entertained. And yeah, of course. and th- th- you know the way people sort of plan their outfits for the entire four day festival. I mean, there's just so much of it is about the you know the aesthetic, which I of course have. Uh, totally understand and respect, but it's a it's a completely different world, especially coming from you know the techno scene. Yeah, it is totally. As a, to, to to me, the first the first time we've got it was like whatever going to a Star Trek convention or something, <laughs> yeah, or, or like a live action role play thing. Or yeah. Something. But, so so it, it felt kind of strange to me. So, mm-hmm. so I I was taught by Rascal um, um, to wear black. Okay. Um, that's okay. <laughs> just to blend in, um, just to run. I guess. Um, yeah, it was the first time I also met met, met Ron Eskil and those guys. Um, um, Eskil in one of his suits. I guess back in those days he had a black suit, mm-hmm. and then Ronan got his bowling shorts with those tiger prints and all that shit on it. Yeah. Um, and I thought, okay, they they're really standing out here due to a kind of not so super fashionable outfit. Yeah. <laughs> so. It, it it was it was kind of a different thing to me. So I was super happy to to run into Joachim of Covenant and talk about Pink Floyd and feel safe for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when when we got to this middle altar market, yeah. I was like really shocked. Lucky enough, I knew Tom from SITD, which I know very very long. We played tennis together in the early mid eighties or something. Or he grew up around the corner where I lived. Yeah. Um, and, and we haven't, whatever, met each other for decades or something. We weren't that close while being in the tennis club or something. Um, so, so he was kind of helpful of, of introducing me into a whole kind of codex, yeah. uh, even of, of how to behave or something. It's just like, okay, you're, you're not you're not screaming while the band is playing, something like that. Yeah. So, so it was like, okay, uh, uh, hello, I'm the new guy. Um, yeah. How do I blend in nicely without um, being too strange? I still remember wearing on stage kind of an artificial fur jacket or something that I that I lent from my mother because <laughs> I didn't have a I didn't have a black coat or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. it, it, it was it was super, it, it was kind of super funny. It, so it took me a while to get into this whole idea of 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 the dark whatever black goth scene thing. yeah so it, it was easier to get into the music because there's something to it mm-hmm. um that i really like and even in, in techno class we played nights of rap we played early front 242 and and some of those stuff of course in the early days um 
so so I felt kind of, of familiar with the whole electronic music, um, right? Um, and even if I totally despise that I still do trance music at all, um, it was kind of okay to 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 get influences in, into Rascal's idea of Rota Sun sound and right, and even find it in whatever Covenant scholarship support I guess that was kind of released at that time around that time. Yeah, like, early 2000s, oh, okay, all okay, that I stuff. I don't understand the vibe. Uh, still, I don't get it. What part of it is goth now? But okay, okay it, it, it kind of resonates with the people. So there must be something to it. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the that's that's kind of the real uh, point. I think, uh, at least for me, when I when I kind of look at industrial pop as a, as a, as a f- philosophical artistic idea. It's like basically trying to highlight the fact that what we think of as goth music or industrial music in 2021 really is not in any way goth or industrial, at least not no. anything like what it was when it started. No, I guess it's not even underground at all. No, anymore. no. Part of, it, part of it is obviously, but but we have seen a lot of even H and M or something put off some street goth stuff, sure, uh, like 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 black codes, and that even is six, seven, eight years ago. So, so it came into as, as a normal thing of zeitgeist or something. Certainly, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, yeah. it's already, uh, yeah. It's 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 you really see it sort of being reflected in in mainstream culture these days. So I feel like it's almost kind of like 1994, you know, when Nine Inch Nails was the biggest thing in the world. I feel like we're kind of getting recharged for a, a moment yeah. like that yeah it, it, it's it's kind of that and you even get a lot of whatever kind of dark soundish um um ideas even in, in in most of of netflix tv shows or something oh yeah um, you, you find something referencing to it i guess whatever wasn't it uh, how to get away with murder that has nearly in the first season in 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 every episode there is one or two imx tracks or something okay which is not a goth artist at all especially not in the us he's not seen as it um but but there were tons of tons of shows where you got a kind of gothy idea in it yeah and then i guess even nine inch nails is doing a lot of movie soundtracks and all that stuff because because it's a kind of of zeitgeisty feel to it so yeah. i was always kind of surprised i guess it was the first time i i went uh uh, I, I stumbled over an interview with Prayers on Vice or something. Yeah, with the idea of of, of holo goth and stuff like that. Yeah, but how the, how the hell should it fit together? And and if you, when you see them talk and and you get a bit of their mindset, how they grew up in this thing, you think like, yeah, okay, goth, the idea of goth in a in a street scene in 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 in, in you know in a street gang in San Diego, it, it's like a meter level of underground. <laughs> yeah. it's like the gang in itself obviously is, is, is usually connected to a kind of hip-hop culture i guess and, and they all look like it so they got this whole uh, hockey shirt styling thing with the wasn't a sherman 83 thing or something uh, with, with the gang of the prayers guys come from um yeah and you get like, okay if, if you want a more special in this underground thing and so you we are again in this um, micro niche and and subculture of a subculture of a subculture an echo, an echo of an echo, which is the more <laughs> nine-inch nailish. Um, um, then you get this kind of a consequence in it to to get more special in a even special kind of scene. I think what is actually interesting about that, though, um, is that uh, there is uh, uh, probably like the majority of like Mexican American teenagers in uh, at least in in LA uh, where I grew up they all love Morrissey. Um, and I didn't actually know this growing up, um, but I, you know, I had a coworker and, uh, and he was Mexican American and we were closing up. Uh, I worked at guitar center, which was a music shop and, uh, we were closing up and I put on a Smith CD and this dude is like, you know, uh, running around the whole, uh, the whole store singing every word to every single Smith song. And I was mm-hmm. like, Oh, dude, do you like Morrissey? He's like, of course I like Morrissey. I'm Mexican. And I had no, <laughs> I, I had no, no idea. No. Um, so I think, I think that there's probably, uh, there's that cultural seed of liking this kind of like new wavy uh, Morrissey Smith's thing that probably kind of 
seeds the rest of that, but I don't want to presume too much because I don't know too much about it. Yeah, but but it's still um, visible with whatever. Um, uh, she passed away. Mm -hmm. Something with, with, who are huge in, in, in South America, as far as I know. And, and, and they're huge in Texas or something. Mm -hmm. Just took the, talk to the guy who, um, who's doing all the merch and, and even some management stuff, I guess, for them. And he was like, it's it's stupidly amazing they play whatever thousand thousand five hundred or played not at the moment uh, whatever one and a half thousand people in, in in texas or something yeah and it was like okay that that's kind of a weird thing that that this like seed of pure old wavy gothiness kind of resonates yeah in the hispanic community i mean depeche mode is is huge out there so i think it's it's all just sort of like a i don't I don't know. They're, they're, these these uh, these bands are are so massively popular, and I think I think uh, we don't even really recognize it. But uh, mm -hmm. but so for but at least for me, like the whole the whole uh, prayers thing made sense because of of you know being from Southern California and and seeing all these 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 guys in that community being like all about Morrissey. <laughs> yeah i've never was deep into morrissey and smith to be honest i i don't know why i am a massive massive smith fan like well i i just love the hell out of morrissey and smith i mean that's that's a whole sort of uh separate the art from the artist type yeah. <laughs> type thing yeah but, you don't want to get down into this um into this whole uh, gossip about morrissey all the time oh no no i've <laughs> I'm I'm happy to just be like I like the music and I don't want to have any further conversations. <laughs> oh, so but I'm um, sorry if I'm now um, making questions here. Oh, um, you're free to so, do so. So industrial pop actually isn't um, kind of an um, artistic concept you're you're going to develop music in, but it's more like a statement that the music that you do already is industrial pop. Yeah, I mean it's I think it's sort of like a reflection on, on 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 the music and the connection to a scene idea oh. i think i think it's it's both right sort of like my tastes uh inform my uh philosophy and my philosophy sort of like informs my output it's yeah. i think i think there's no way to say that it's absolutely one thing or the other but yeah. i think if i if i take sort of uh, a step back and think about, you know, the music that I grew up on, you know, of course I grew up on top 40 radio, Madonna, Michael Jackson, uh, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And it just sort of informed everything that I wanted to hear in music. And so when I started getting into uh, the goth scene, um, I only liked the bands that were really poppy, right? So Nine Inch Nails, Manson, and then yeah. people were like, oh, you should listen to, uh, I, I don't know. Um, Stubborn Girls. <laughs> yeah, and you're just like, no, yeah, I remember the first time I bought a Neubauten album and I brought it home, I was just like, oh, this is going to be sick. And it was just like... It was sick. It, <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> there was, I, yeah, it was, it was just absolutely nothing like what I was expecting. And, mm. you know, and then, you know, stuff like like Ministry, who I've, come to appreciate more later in life. But, you know, back then I was just like, this is not, these are not pop songs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The early ministry was much more poppy actually, of course. Well, when they started, but you know, the, yeah, the record, started. the record that I got was Psalm 69. Oh, okay. <laughs> and okay. I was just like, Jesus built my hot rod is nothing like, uh, had like a hole. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so it was, if, if you get a two second loop out of it, then it might get some similarity at the right point. But yeah, not as a full track <laughs> exactly but i think uh i think as i uh as i as, as i got older you know I, I started appreciating appreciating other things but i i certainly realized that i was always drawn to the more uh, uh melodic the poppier you know structured structured songs and then you know when i when i started uh getting called like a sellout or, you know, that I had gone pop or something with an album, like yeah. a violent emotion. I was just kind of like at first a little bit scratching my head because I hadn't really thought about these things at all. I was just like, yeah. I'm just making music that I like. And then I started kind of doing a, you know, like a post-mortem on my own history and like, Oh yeah. Okay. I can, I can see the threads of the music that I grew up in kind of coming through yeah. into what I'm doing now. So, uh, you know, this is what uh, sets me apart 
from everybody else. Ah. Uh, I remember. I remember when. I guess when you sent the first whatever demos or something before I started working on it of uh, All Beauty Destroyed. Uh, was it the one? I, yeah, yeah. All Beauty Destroyed, third album. Um, and that we talked about, and and I remember saying to you something. Okay, I see a handwriting now, and I called it kind of an um, um, Adams Family electro thing. <laughs> I don't know if you remember it. I don't. Which I can still find because because you always get this kind of, uh, you often get this kind of kind of a vintage organ thing going in there. Like okay. Some, a bit feel I like those sixties organ stuff. Yeah. And started after violent emotion. I, I, I remember that kind of well. That was kind of this memory drops that I wouldn't have got without talking to you know <laughs> that's so funny I don't remember that but it's 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 true that I have always been drawn to those sort of like spooky uh, uh, yeah. or uh, uh, rot rotary organ type sounds and I yeah, yeah. I always called it the for, for time I called it Adam Family Electro that's funny <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah so it's like I was always trying to um, figure out like what to call it and, and, and how to, how to sort of like walk that line. And then, yeah. and then as, and then just, you know, in the last few years, I think, I think what really sort of turned the page for me was I was listening to typo negative and I realized that their song Christian woman is almost exactly the same as, um, blue Monday by new order. <laughs> And I was like, I should listen to it. <laughs> it's it's like from yeah. the, the the vocal melodies and yeah. the chord progression and just the way the melodies all interact. It is essentially uh, uh, New Order. Blue uh, it's, it's Blue Monday. Yeah. So yeah. I was just like, there's literally no difference between these things. It's a coloring issue, right? It's 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 a it's an image mixed with uh, you know a couple of sprinkles of Adam's Family organ here and you know yeah. whatever there. It's it's there the the differences are there there are less differences than there are similarities and yep. when we got to this um point earlier about how there's nothing shocking anymore and i realized that everybody in this scene like they're willing to accept everything for the most part unless you say oh i like rihanna or i like katy perry yep. or something so it's 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 almost a a, a rebellious thing to say oh I'm going to now take inspiration actively from what you perceive as the enemy. So yeah. So Especially you, when you say it. If you just do it, it just works. Yeah. No, but you have because, to say it. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you have to say it. You have, you have to really bump the fist in their faces and say, okay, um, this got a connection to Rihanna or whatever, whatever pop reference you put there. And, and then you get resistance on it. Exactly. Which is kind of weird because then it's really coming back to wave gothic as a kind of a convention or a fashion show or something. Because because then it's still keeping to the image. As long as you keep your image properly up, you're you're blending in the scene with the music anyway. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's with, a, with with a lot of bands, so I would say whenever um, there there are what was this latest V and V single? Um, when is the future or something? Yeah. That was kind of a straight edge electro disco track. Mm -hmm. And it was super Italo disco driven actually with some darker sparkles that weren't even dark. Um, but th that's the thing, and it's, you it's got a lot of sparkles. That, that works into a that, that works into a scene or even a dance floor just just because it kind of fits in there as image or idea, or the people dancing to it. It's even then kind of a collective kind of idea of acceptance or something. I mean, there's a there's a band that I will not publicly name, but uh, I I I quite like them as people, and I like their music. But I am fully uh, convinced that they are a schlager band, yep. but but they just sing their songs uh, an octave lower, and yep. uh, all of the sort of uh, uh, goofy schlager melodies are just replaced with a super saw synth. Yep. <laughs> There are tons of it, and of that kind of band. Yeah. And then you put then you put future pop on it, and it does somehow work. But it's. But it's I guess nowadays you don't put future pop on it. Uh, you put synth pop on it or electro pop or something else. Exactly. But it's it's just interesting to see fans of this band be like, "Oh, we listen to this band, but we hate 
pop music and pop music culture and all of this kinds of thing. And so that's, that's my reasoning for instead of just sort of like doing it and letting the music speak for itself, I'm actively sort of shoving it in people's faces and saying, look, this is what I'm doing. And this is why I find it interesting. Yeah. Which is, which is okay. Cause it makes you kind of, um, uh, uh, safer or something. Cause, cause you're not attackable with the discovery that there's some pop in your music. And yeah. it's not like a big aha moment of, Ooh, ooh I, I found out that in Aesthetic Perfection, there's a pop reference. Ooh, ooh, ooh I didn't yeah. knew about that. Um, so by, by actively pushing it forward, it's just saying, yeah, it is what it is. I love it or hate it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think, I think also that level of uh, transparency, transparency is, is something that um, not everyone will like but at least sort of like my audience you know they appreciate the fact that uh you're honest with them and not sort of pretending to be something you're not i think a lot of bands uh especially you know in the 90s and stuff like that there was always this it was about th this image and, and maintaining an image that isn't really uh consistent with who you are so at least i have of course i have an image of course i have like a a, a public persona but yeah. my public persona is just a magnified version of of myself right so there's some honesty there which i think people appreciate yeah of course you need some honesty in this kind of uh, avatar you're representing on stage of course um couldn't it be the other way around actually it's like if you put in if you put out your whatever kind of a weak spot actively like okay there's some pop music in my stuff uh, isn't it something like shielding your your own whatever anxiety problems or something from the public so as, as far as i know or even for myself like like for most people doing music they they all deal with problems of uncertainty whatever kind of in the, not in a not in a pathologic idea of anxiety or something but an insecureness of sure course. put in personal some kind of personal personality in the music no, not by not by design, but simply because you do it. Because so there's some personal connection between you and your music. So so if someone is attacking your music, he's somehow attacking you. Um, mm -hmm. So so if you if you just get there and say, okay, here's a weak spot in the music, so you all can j fucking jump on it. Yeah, uh, like, I'm not singing, but that was the first thing that I would usually say is like, okay, I, I know my, my singing is not good or something. And then everybody will jump on it like, yeah, it's really not good. Listen to blah, blah, blah. I can really sing. Uh, listen to Valjanov. He can really sing and, and your singing sucks big time or something. But, but I'm not attackable by it because I put it on myself. And I guess that, that's some of a, kind of a scheme that, that I found in a lot of bands that, that they somehow... Like in a play, they put off a weak spot in sure. the hope that everyone jumps on. Yeah. Um, um, so 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 they can say, yeah, okay, I, t I told you yourself. Mm -hmm -hmm. So 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 you can touch me with my insecureness at that point. I mean, it's it's certainly true that when you highlight flaws in yourself, like you take the wind out of the sails of people who want to criticize yeah. you. Like if somebody wants to make like a bald joke about me or whatever, it's like, yeah, I know. I it's like, yeah. you know I. I don't care. I know. Uh, I know. So looking like mesh. <laughs> I've been do, I've been doing the beanie work. thing lately, and I actually like it. I think I think it adds to my sort of countryside credibility. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the special Austrian beanie countryside credibility. I, I I just feel like people look at me differently when I'm wearing the beanie, and I'm not wearing like the cap. I don't know. Maybe oh, it, okay. It's it's interesting. Uh, and, and my family's always like, you, you know, you look real good in the beanie. And grandma's like, can I knit you another beanie? I'm like, <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> Take yeah, I got a lot of stuff made. Even this is a self-made beanie by my, whatever is a stepmom. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. Beanies are good. I've, I'm certainly, uh, I'm, I'm certainly a, a, a convert to the beanie club. So I'll, <laughs> I'll wear it. I'll wear it for my next one of these. Welcome. <laughs> 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 yeah, There's a lot of pleasure in the beanie club. Yes. It, it, it has some hidden treasures to be found. 
yeah, like like warm ears. Because this yeah, is warm ears, ears is a good point in it actually. Yeah, and um, you're not hearing that much, which is awesome. From time to time, I actually have a, a like one of those Russian caps, you know, with the the ear oh, flaps, okay, yeah. and I always yeah. go go on hikes with them, and I can't hear anything anybody says. So, I just got one from whatever that's whatever decade ago or something from um, um, Das Bunker John. He made some of those yeah. Russian hats with the, with the Das Bunker logo, and and, and I still got it because I. I still like to wear it um, um, when I'm uh, live mixing bands or something. Like not at the moment when I'm mixing them actually, but before that, because it's kind of shielding your ear from the support band or, or whatever. It's not because I don't like them, just because it's fucking too loud. Yeah. Do you, um, do you, uh, how do I, how do I say this in a way that, <laughs> do you, do you miss the the concerts these days or are you happy to not be completely uh, constantly pummeled with loud music uh, it, it's kind of a two-bladed sword so um i really like being in the studio i really enjoy it and and i really liked um during this whatever pandemic shutdown lockdown whatever you want to call it over here um um this thing of getting deep into some kind of music because you can get into the flow and not being called like okay uh, from monday to thursday i'm i might be in the studio and then over the weekdays uh, oh yeah they're gonna be some night setup shows and then whatever i'm mixing neurotic fish and yeah um, oh yeah and, and and on friday there's a show there and i want to meet someone blah 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 so so it, it really helped me to get to get again deeper in, in into what is my what is my musical safe space or mm -hmm. something that's something that, that the second Wiesenberg album is more about. It's 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 more of a shamanistic experience for me in, in a bit. It, it's like really not caring about anything and just trusting myself like, mm -hmm. like in an instinct way. That doesn't mean that it's super avant or super new or something. No, it's it, it just like it's just like letting it go and not not caring about too much. Whether, that's hard to do. An album at all. I don't think it's an album at all. Uh, it's it's a collection of tracks that somehow might fit together or not. I'm mm -hmm. I'm too deep into it to judge it. Um, so that side is good. What what I really miss about concerts is is that kind of random sociability. Mm -hmm. it's like when when you get a club, you go regularly to or whatever. Um, you can just go there and meet someone, and you don't know who you are meeting. So someone will be there, and it's the same with yeah. with concerts for me. So you you definitely will meet someone who's also doing music like we have worked with or and, and not even have an appointment with him or just randomly run into people and that's something that i really miss missing that i really like because everything like like a part of your of your wife and and whatever some closer friends you meet from time to time everything now that's is social is kind of scheduled mm -hmm. so so there's a lack of kind of randomness and everything is kind of planned and very organized and and i'm a big fan of this whole chaos of, of fatalistic ideas yeah like things coming to me and i take them mm -hmm. or not it's like a friend of mine just put it like this what she's really missing is the um uh, opportunity not to go somewhere <laughs> yeah. it's like you invited somewhere and then you say oh sorry i couldn't come i yeah. can't come Sorry, I've got whatever. I got something else to do. Yeah, because you don't want to. Um, and and there's something deep in it that I would totally agree on. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like this whatever Bartleby idea of um, I would prefer not to, and I would have and I would prefer to have the opportunity to say I would prefer not to. Yeah, instead of oh I want to. <laughs> it's it's maybe very hedonistic to to expect like there's a. There's a big variety of parties and concerts to choose from every day, and I can just say, I don't want to go to any of this. Yeah, uh -huh, I can stay home. But but it makes me feel better to have this. Um, I actually talked with uh, Jörg about this idea of um, subtractive changes. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really like to have this idea of um, not doing something. It, it, it gives me actually more freedom than the freedom to do th something. It's it's more like the freedom to say, no, I don't go yeah. anywhere. I'm going to have to try that out I, when things come back because I think my biggest problem is that I don't like letting people down and I don't like saying no. And I also 
uh, suffer from the, you know, the fear of missing out, the, the idea that if I did say no, I might miss out on what is the greatest uh, uh, night of my life or whatever, because <laughs> it's, it's certainly true uh, what you said, you know, it, when you, when you go out somewhere, you, you, you run into someone, it's, it's just this moment of serendipity and you have a, a great evening hanging out with someone that you had no plans on hanging out with. Yeah, that's beautiful because that, that's a positive beautifulness and the other side is uh, you, if I don't want to go, I don't need to. Because I'm not in the mood for the greatest day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way I'm going to try to look at it uh, in in the future. Because for me, it was it was it's always been so hard for me to say no, and and especially um, you know when I was living in LA, it was really bad because you know there was an event every single day. Of course, and you just always have this social pressure to go out or, or you have this internal pressure where you're like, Oh, you know, maybe I'll go out and you know, the terrible douchebag LA uh, mentality of like, maybe I'll meet somebody that will like really help my career or something. It's just yep. really awful. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're so overpowered with expectation about, about an evening or something. Yeah. Um, and the thing I'm not good at in saying no actively, mm -hmm. but I'm a really big fan of, not getting into a situation where I need to say no or yes. So I'm uh -huh. just like, yeah, yeah, I might, I'm, I might drop by at the party or maybe not, <laughs> which I'm not saying. So, so I might drop by, I will, let's see. And yeah. And if I'm not going, it's fine for me too. Can we take a short break? I just had a nice in between conversation uh -huh. with Jörg, which is a rather interesting point. As he talked about, um, how did you put it? This, yeah, 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 this thing with the, um, um, uh, with the fashion show, wave gothic, yeah. individualism. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting because this is the point where uh, people are actually contributing something to the whole of the, of the situation. Yeah. And in that moment, you know, we perceive them as narcissistic or, 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 you know, having everything. Ah, yeah, yeah. 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 Did you did you hear it? No. <laughs> okay. So it's like we were talking about wave gothic and 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 the narcissistic element in the audience by by wearing special stuff. Um. And and we kind of put it out as an as a weird or, or bad point or something, like not with a completely easy positive connotation. Um. Whereas they actually contribute to the thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's like it's like the same that we got this authority position on stage it's like they get into the same idea of an gamification mm -hmm. thing over style so then I think they are not that different it's oh no oh no it, it, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a typical kind of yuck thought or it's even a thought that we had back in the days when we um when we made straft hunts together it, it's like we always said the idea the the better people aren't on stage mm. that was always kind of of a mantric thing and it, it wasn't about that the that the better people are the the amount or the collectiveness of people it's like each and every one of them is special and likely and positively and possibly better than us or something a part of in maybe creating a proper dance beat <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's totally true um and and i hope that uh it didn't come across like i was saying that i feel like the sort of um uh fashion show nature or the uh egotistical side of uh the goth scene or uh music festivals is a is a bad thing I actually, no, but I, it's, um, it's, it's like the a contradiction to this, whatever my, my early and, and still very, very me forming, um, um, impressions of, of early techno events. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's a different it's like world, a different thing. It's like yeah. the, the, the pop nature of goth in, in this whole idea of individualistic ego centric kind of style, Certainly. Or setting yourself apart from from the rest of it is even 
within the scene. It's not like just the scene is setting itself apart from a mainstream or something. It's like everyone in the scene is trying to be then be even more goth, more special or, yeah. or, or, or more stylish or something. Sure. So, so it, it, it's kind of a collective ego narcissistic trip. Mm -hmm. way. And, and that's kind of a very, I, I think it's a very pop, pop musical idea. Of course. Uh, where it's not very collective at all. It's more like the, the, there is a star and it must not be the, the music star on stage. It's even kind of a styling star in the audience or, yeah. or in the agra or something. Halt. Yeah, I think I think it's 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 actually quite cool because, um, you know, of course, I'm a, a front man of a band. Uh, I didn't. I didn't choose this um, choose this job because I don't have an ego that I need fed. This is yeah, <laughs> this is absolutely a narcissistic endeavor, um, yeah. and I totally understand that uh, other people out there uh, have the same sort of feelings and and you know need to be validated and uh, and you know, if they're not uh, going to express that by being a, a, a front person of a band, you know, they're going to get the, you know, come up with the coolest outfit and wear it to VGT and make sure all the photographers yeah. are swarming around them. But I think, I think it's, it's okay to, um, to, 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 to engage in this stuff as long as you are self-aware enough to know that it doesn't actually make you better than anybody else. And this is really just sort of like a selfish uh, a, a, a selfish th thing that you do. Um, I think the problem is, is then when, when people start acting like that, attention makes them better than anybody else. Yep. That's the problem. And then it's, that's a good problem. I'm definitely not free of any kind of, um, I'm definitely all into this narcissistic thing, even on stage. <clears throat> I, I totally get it and I can even um, relate to it. It's not an abstract thing for me or something. It's, of course, it feels super nice. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about it. It's, and oh no, of course it's feeling true an ego and, and then I usually compare it um ah, I just can't do it in German, but whatever it's it, it's like when you're a baby and whatever and taking a shit and you show it to your mother. That's a super common thing if you're a baby. It's like, <laughs> oh look at that, I yeah. and it, and it's the same kind of thing. So so you get an instant feedback yeah. um that is not the kind of a rational analysis of anything. So it's kind of right. <laughs> it got a kind of emotional purity that, that I guess no one can deny that it's feeling kind of good. Yeah. Um, and, and and it's the same with the outfit or something. So certainly, I guess we're all in the same thing. We just got different kind of specialities, and some have more luck or even more expertise. Yeah. Or are simply not just better, but it works. Of so, course. But you know, there there are people that do not want that kind of attention at all. No. You know, no. I know, I know people that are like, I would hate to be a musician. I would hate to be on stage. I would hate to have people applauding me. This is, this is, this is, you know, it's like, it's, it's the equivalent of having the nightmare where you're in, uh, you know, uh, in your underwear in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. It took, it took Rusk, um, roughly over a year to get me on stage. Really? I, w I wasn't totally up for it. I was like, no, I'm what the hell should I do there? So yeah. the first shows I was really hiding behind um, um, some double layer keyboard stands and stuff like that. So so I'm not away from it. And I'm still, um, at one point I ran into a guy who was at the shows and, and he got some dancing schools, like traditional dancing schools and do, does some TV coaching. And he was like, okay, uh, I see what you're doing there during the Rotterdam show. So as long as you're hinter behind your DJ desk and keyboard <laughs> something you feel kind of safe because you've got that wall between of course you. um and as i do from time to time in some songs um, like a or something i run around in the front and do some uh, shouting with my kind of femaleish voice um and he says like yeah but if you're there in front you move totally different your whole attitude changes like your whole body language and and it looks like you're fleeing from someone somewhere because you feel naked or something and insecure yeah and it really taught me some whatever techniques like 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 not walking with the music like knocking rhythm or something because mm -hmm. uh, then i look like a pregnant rabbit or something <laughs> that's how i describe it when i see it on youtube uh -huh. um because then, then you start to hop a bit and then it looks kind of stupid 
Um, so, so it really took me a while to get into this uh, differentiation of, like you said it too, like 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 there's a me, there's a Christian Wesenberg, and that's me, and then then there's a guy called Christian Wesenberg, which exactly looked like me, and he's on stage, but he's he's kind of a different person. Yeah. That there's not too much theater or something or, or like whatever acting in it, but it's it's still a bit of a different mindset. Like, like I'm I'm just representing him. Yeah. More like, which is an, in, an interesting thing that a lot of people just being enjoying a show or something don't think about that. That you being on stage is not the same person that you meet uh, uh, in the kitchen making coffee or something. Yeah. Th that, that's a bit of a split. Like you said, it's a magnified version of it. Mm -hmm. I, I would say it's just, it, it just kind of an of a slice of it or something. It's of like course. A music representation slice. Yeah, it's, 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 for me, the way that I view it is like, it's this one sort of element of myself and then it's magnified. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, the person that you get when, when, when I'm on stage is absolutely not the person you get when I'm making coffee or scooping the cat litter box or, you know, being, yeah, yeah. it's not even the same person um, you know, that you meet when you're actually making music in the no. studio thing or at home. No, it's, it's a totally different kind of, not totally different, but, but it's a different thing. Yeah. I think, uh, one of my, one of my favorite questions to ask people when we have these conversations is, uh, I think that there are people that are sort of natural born performers and then there are people that are sort of creatives and then there are people that are sort of in the middle. Um, and then that sort of changes as you know, life goes on. Right. So you, you yeah. said that you're more comfortable now with performing. Like, do you feel I'm not with creating? So, but I'm, I'm more, yeah, I'm more comfortable with performing now that I was before, but I'm still seeing myself more as an, as, as a creator or even as a craftsman or something yeah. when it comes to some part of it. But actually the, the whole idea of craftsmanship or something like, like the whole technical side of making music, um, 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 just helped me to, to get to the point where I can create without thinking about the technical questions of it. It's mm -hmm. just about freeing me myself from, from feeling this insecurity of how does it sound technically? How does it translate on a bigger, smaller PA? Mm. Um, and did I cut out the right frequency here and there and something? Um, um, I wanted to get over it. Um, and, and that at one point it just happened. That was at actually the initial point for, for putting out stuff under my own name, Wiesenberg again. Mm -hmm. it was when the point when I started just as I do from time to time, whatever, um, just fiddled around to play around with some new technical toys you got then just realized okay yeah, yeah there's something of a rough structure just playing around with it and and then the day later i realized like okay i, I didn't spend actively thinking time about mixing or something i just just did it and let it go and it sounded super all right yeah i was wow that's a magic moment uh, I'm, I'm i'm just doing it like whatever a, a, a good guitar playing is just feeling the guitar as an extension of himself yeah so and that's what i really like someone's calling me i know it's peter from the cool temple so no, I'm not um i i asked this question because i think uh through my sort of time in lockdown I've, I've kind of come to uh realize that i'm much more of a sort of creative uh, studio type person uh than i am a, a performer because you know uh, touring with somebody, you know, like Joey, who is just a performer through and through, like every fiber of his body is a performer. And he, you know, he doesn't even get nervous before he goes on stage. He's like, he's actively excited about going out there and doing what it is that, you know, he does yeah. best. Um, and, you know, I still have this feeling where it's like, I have to get into the headspace. I have to, you know, I have to have conversations with myself, all this kind of stuff. Like I still feel the fear. I still feel the, the, uh, the hesitation and, yep. and it actually gets worse with age for me. <clears throat> so I, yep. w when I was younger, I was just like, yeah, fuck it. Just, you know, I'll just go on stage and, and not even really think too much about it. But now, uh, now I have to actively work to get out of my head. And I realized that 
I'm just this kind of creator who is in his head almost yep. all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're, they're these natural born performers. Definitely. I guess Rusk is definitely one of them. Um, who, who just get on stage because it's it's kind of a natural habitat for them. Mm -hmm. It's like this stage is home for them. Yeah. And, and, and I'm always kind of happy when I get back to the studio and, and just start doing something. Yeah. Especially like whenever I'm um, creating bass drums or something. Let's yeah. Have a fetch or do whatever. Um, I mean, it's like the same thing for them with being on stage. It's like it's it's their home. It's yeah. in a safe space being there technically not naked, but kind of naked mm -hmm. in, in, in front of of a lot of people and, and doing their thing, which I would say, wow, there, there's a lot of opportunity to do really stupid and dull things. <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of opportunity to do stupid things in the studio. It's just you don't have to share it with other people. Yeah, you don't have to share it. So, so on stage, it's everything is at the moment and it's already shared with a lot of people. Yep. So for me, it's, it, it was interesting because I was very happy to have this time away from the world to just kind of uh, create without expectation or deadline because, you know, for the last 10 years or something, it's always just been like, okay, time to, you know, when you have studio time, you, you just create and you try to make, you know, whatever your next hit is or something like that. So there's always that pressure um, and, and then with and this always the perspective of a, of a life translation. Or something exactly. Like and, and so having that freedom to essentially do nothing for a year, which is not to say that I did nothing, but I, I just, I got to be in here uh, away from the world and just make stuff for like a year. And, and it didn't matter if it was good or if it was bad. I could try out all these different ridiculous ideas that had popped into my head, you know, while I was on tour, but I never had the uh, opportunity yeah. to sort of like go down the rabbit hole or explore. Um, and I, I really love that. And, and, and I started asking myself, it's like, do I ever want to go on stage again? Because I have all of this. I, I enjoy what I'm doing here, but yeah. now, now, uh, what are we like 13, 14 months in now? I'm kind of like, but I'm not out there. Sh like now I'm releasing stuff and I'm like, I'm not sharing this with the world. I'm not getting any sort of that ego feedback that I, I guess I did need. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Cause it's a bit what, what I was reflecting on, like being back in the studio, like in the nineties or something. So back in the days, of course, there was no digital market and no social media, blah, blah, blah. So there were some whatever magazines and that's it. And, and, and you put out whatever vinyl records, of course, back at those days, 12 inches. Um, and you didn't know what people are actually thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You just got some reviews and then maybe you met some DJ somewhere who said, okay, this is good, this is bad, whatever. Or record labels telling you numbers are bad or something, but you didn't have that direct feedback on your tracks, right? Or, or even not as you have, uh, like you have it when you're playing live, of course. And you also got a direct impact of, of the songs you wrote. Yeah, which is totally different from a DJ experience where you mostly play records you're not personally involved in. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's kind of the thing I'm really enjoying in it is, is that kind of not being not, not getting this pressure of expectation what someone else is thinking because you don't get it because you're just doing the music and and you might then get it through social media especially for someone like you got a big following ship and something um, um that's something that i really always enjoyed in the studio thing so mm. so you just do your thing as as good as you can whatever good means in that context just you're giving into it what you got. Yeah, you point. just do your best all the time. Just, just do your best, yeah. And 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 um, um, the quality of best is kind of super individual. What it means actually. Um, and then just put it out to the world and and let that baby do its own path. Yeah. And that's kind of good. That's something I really like about it. It's like d detaching the the music from me. Absolutely. Like, well, once it is done, it gets out and it, it's a free own entity. Yeah, 
It doesn't belong to you anymore. I feel the same way. It doesn't belong to me anymore. I, I, I've just did it. Yeah, I'm more like whatever, if you put it in spiritual terms, I'm more like a medium or something, getting yeah. something from whatever Akasha field or every kind of collective conscious ideas. Just just channeling stuff from the channeling, universe. Filtering it, whatever, like filtered coffee or something. So uh, yes. Powder, and then in the end, there's a warm coffee drink, something mm -hmm. liquid. So, so I'm just getting thoughts, ideas, whatever, feelings that are not very special or exclusive, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and just channeling them in, into tones, and, and then you got this kind of tasty or untasty coffee. But you don't yeah. get to drink it. You don't have to drink it. No, I don't have to drink it. I, yeah. I, I just spit it out. I just spit out sonic coffee into the worldwide web or, yeah. or little discs. Yeah, I've, 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 I've found what's really, really interesting is that um, with the sort of timelines, deadlines that I'm working against, you know, releasing and, you know, writing a song, releasing a song every single month. Um, I don't really have too much time to nitpick or agonize over things. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're just sort of like, okay, that's good enough. And you just, you just move quite quickly, um, which I, I feel actually results in a better product because I'm not getting in my own way the way that I usually do. Like the songs that I work the longest and hardest on are the songs that people care the least about. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's you like that. And, but the real irony is, is that these songs for the most part are doing very well. Like they're doing like better than, you know, on the whole, it's like into the black was a 10 track album. You know, the one song that is still remain popular f since that time is, is gods and gold. Um, you know, the other nine songs, the first one on the album. It's yeah. Pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, like I really, I really slaved over that album for like two years and then, and then, you know, it was the songs that I spent the most time on that, people were just kind of like, okay. But with the singles, I feel like they are connecting more. Uh, and I think it's it's this sort of subconscious, sort of like just channeling stuff that I don't even really fully understand. Um, yeah. But the, the, the real irony is, is that I can't enjoy the success the same way I would if I had some investment in the songs. Yeah, because you don't have control over it. Exactly. It's not a fully controlled process. But but in the end, it's like it's like now these whatever like the singles you released now that are not a fully controlled process with not longer review or whatever yeah. kind of long evaluation over three years or something. Um, I guess they are much more communicative with the audience uh, as a super controlled thing, which is more like teaching. Maybe if yeah. You design song, then it's really like said and done it doesn't it's more like a closed room or, mm -hmm. or, or something you got a message and it's totally and hardly defined mm -hmm. and, and then it's more like putting a message out as a statement which is then more, more the mode of teaching well well you know no more of course everything on a subconscious level more or less like yeah like just happening or something it's more of this um, um spiritual thing of communication it's like this this little difference between religion and and spiritualism it's like spiritualism is asking the big questions and and religions are trying to offer you answers to these big questions but but the whole spir spiritualistic experience is like um asking those questions and and, and get your head around it yeah instead of the answer to it. and i guess it's a bit it's always the same thing a bit a bit with music if, it, if it's too perfect it's, it's like a closed box yeah People can relate on on the level of I like it, I don't like it, I'm a fan, I'm not a fan. But I guess this this subconscious sparkles of openness that, that are in the imperfection of it. Of course, um, yeah. Um, they make they they open space for for resonance. Mm -hmm. That's something also I, I liked about um, a, a lot of the techno music. It, it's like a partly it's like a blank page in a book, like the last page, like 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 room for your own thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's like it doesn't have a melody, something that, that that really keeps your train of thought fixed or something. It's, it's like there's a lot of, like, I always refer to basic channel tracks or something for it, like mm -hmm. dub techno stuff, which are all stupidly long, like well, about eight to 12 minutes tracks. It's not much going on, actually. Um, but I got, got a special magic that you start to create that I always started to create more on top of it in my mind. Mm -hmm. By listening to it, my, my my mind got into its own 
train of thoughts, melodies, rhythmic, even vocals over it. And then it was just like a like a carpet you walk over. And so the individual just has the opportunity to sort of fill in the gaps with whatever it is they need from that song. Yeah, it's like, it's like a pen book or something. It's yeah. like or paint by numbers or something. So you got a rough sketch, which is black and white, and then you can fill in the colors. Yeah. But, uh, it, it, it's like you, you actually can, or you currently instinctively without thinking, add stuff to it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you try to, because obviously brains are working like that. Uh, you try to find a pattern and you try to identify the pattern. And then once you think you got the pattern, um, you, you start building on it. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something. This is a quality about music I always really liked. It's right. like blank page quality that that makes me, that like my make my mind, instinctively add something on it. Yeah, the subject. It's. There. it's it, I. I. I, th I think the subjective nature of music is what makes it so, uh, powerful and, exciting because, um, you know what it means to the creator is kind of irrelevant. Yeah. It. It. It only really matters. Uh, what the person who's uh, hearing it, consuming it, what, what they take away from it, which is why, you know, it doesn't belong to the creator anymore. It's like the creator made it, it's out, and it's not theirs. Yeah, yeah it's like this seed and soil thing or something. You, you put a seed in there, and then you throw it on the world as soil, and then it starts to bloom or not. Yeah, I think... And, and, and every kind of flower is kind of super different on it. Mm-hmm. But as artists, the, we try to we, we try to control this process, right? And yeah, mostly too much. Kind of a market logic in it, and and of course we need to do it, especially if we do it as professionals with a, making a living out of it. Of course, then you try to. And of course, it's possible to get a, a certain kind of nudging into it. Of course, I guess there aren't a lot of people that would play whatever, one of the harsher tracks of violent emotion on a funeral or something. <laughs> there, no. there might be some people doing it actually weirdly, but but not as much as on a proper ballad, like whatever, or Beauty Destroyed or something. Yeah. So, but, but still it relates to people in a certain kind of situation and mood. Usually of course. Kind of halfway predetermined by the style. Yeah, but I think, I think uh, what I'm learning more and more is how how important it is to s sort of take your own ego out of it as much as you can and take your own sort of desperate need to, to control it and, and own it. Uh, yeah. Trying to let go of all of that. Yeah. Which is actually, like I said about the, whatever technical side of mixing, producing stuff or something, it, it's like, it's a really just in the thing of, of, of letting it go and then, just put your instincts there because the whole idea of craftsmanship and formality is part of yourself already. It's like you don't need to really think about it. You might fight tune it or something, but I guess still you are playing there were first chords, first vocal melodies. I don't know actually how you start your songwriting process. Um, but I guess it differs from what I hear in your songs. I think it differs from song to song a bit. Um, but you got the first an idea which isn't bound to a formal idea. Sure. It's just there, and then it somehow unfolds. Uh, like yep. you said, about whatever dead zone, it's like obvious in reference in the verses to Björk's Army of Me or something. But I guess it wasn't the first thing that you intended to do something like Björk's Army of Me. No. No? I, I don't know. Maybe you started whatever fiddling around with a sample beats or something just for the technical fun of it. And then from that point, it unfolded instinctively into something. Or I don't know what the uh, initial sparkle of it maybe it was a line maybe it was that for me for me or whatever for me recently it's actually just trying to um write a song so just yeah. some just some chords and some um vocal melodies uh and then i just try to follow just sort of simple songwriting uh st structural rules in the sense where it's like you know uh you want your highest note to be in your chorus and you want your lower notes to be in your verses and you know you want to uh, increase energy you know th those types of things but i try to keep it as uh as um fluid and subconscious as possible i think uh D dead zone was interesting because um 
I actually did start out with the the drum loop because I was wow. like, oh, the, it might be interesting to make something kind of like in the 90s, you know, when all the 90s songs were were backed by uh, breakbeats. Yes. And and I hadn't heard anybody do that recently, so I was like, okay, let's let's try to go down this uh uh uh, what's the uh, Depeche Mode song that's uh, super like that? Is it uh, Stripped or there's one of those De- Depeche oh, Mode songs oh. like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and uh, and of course Army of Me, which is the the one, when the levee Exciter breaks. Or something. What's that? Isn't it? Isn't it one of the singles of Exciter from the album? Oh no, I'm thinking like '90s Depeche Mode. So like uh, Exciter '90s. Of course, it's '90s. Or no, it's an Exciter. Late nineties. I thought it was like two thousand one, but I'm thinking like ultra okay. Depeche Mode, right? So barrel of a gun. Okay, and, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then of course I I, I was considering uh, uh, Army of Me because I'm actually a big Led Zeppelin fan. So that when the levee yeah. breaks drum loop. Yeah. Um, but it was funny because I had this drum loop and this kind of uh, uh, a walking synth bass thing, but it was different. And I was like, I don't know where to go with this. I, and so it just sat on my hard drive as, as, as this version, as, as, as this loop, as this eight bar loop. And it's hard to always get out of the eight bar loop. Right. Yes. But, uh, but then I was like, okay, I got to write a song around it. So then, then without the loop and without the, uh, the, the bass line, I wrote a chord progression and then I wrote the vocals and stuff. And then I transposed it onto the existing sort of, beat and i had to change the the synth line and stuff to fit into the scale of the song and yeah so it's it's really a lot of trying to what's interesting for me is that i have a lot of inspiration but i don't have a lot of technical know-how uh especially with when it comes to music theory so i'm always trying to uh catch up with the technical stuff so so that i have a way to so i have a language with which to express my ideas yeah yeah i can totally understand it because i'm not a i'm I'm not a songwriter at all actually of course not i'm not not even super interested in it (laughs) i think it's like the most fascinating thing ever songwriting it's just so really yeah because when i hear i like arrangement but i'm not into songwriting that's so funny because when I hear it, you'll probably laugh at me, but when I hear something like uh, Don't Want to Miss a Thing by Aerosmith, yeah. I'm like, Beautiful. that song is just so perfectly written and arranged. And it's just every, every, every step of it makes sense, but it's also exciting. So it's predictable enough, but not, but not uh, too predictable where it's boring. And I just, I find this kind of songwriting to be, uh, uh, magical to me, and I'm always okay. tr- trying to find I, I, I this. Do the, I do get the fascination of it, but I, but as you said, I think it's very magical because mm-hmm. there is a bit of formula to it. Yeah, it's like the whole whatever, but that's a bit theoretical now. Like like magic usually is kind of connected to an idea of formulas, mm-hmm. like, like casting a spell or something, which. <laughs> all fantasy thing it's like like a formula or something and i was i think it's fascinating um but it's not mine i'm usually sure i'm i'm more coming from whatever an alchemistic idea maybe yeah uh, especially when it comes to rotosand it's more of an alchemistic thing i'm doing it's, it's more like mixing blending things together and, and and try to bring them into a context that's not destroying the magic too much right <laughs> Actually, yeah. I think of it in this way of like, 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 if if you're an architect, you can't just build a house without any understanding of you know physics and <laughs> construction and and stuff like that, right? So, but even without an idea uh, about proportions, of course, which is then something that totally fits into the thing of music. Exactly, but but you also don't want to be so rigid that you're just making uh you know uh uh the same house over and over again you want to i think about frank lloyd wright right you know it's like he was an architect who understood what he was doing but there was this magic there so it's this balance right yeah yeah there's i totally understand because there's a kind of unfixed form that 
that is whatever kind of a universal language or something especially when it comes to music where there's a lot of this old greek cosmic idea and and how it does translate to frequencies and then into uh, harmonic and disharmonic and chord structures and everything um it's the same with with proportions and architecture i think um and there was in i don't know if it was xenakis i guess it, it was him or something that that put it uh, like architecture is a frozen music <laughs> really it's kind of yeah yeah it's kind of interesting and he even uh, he mainly made music but was an architect too um because it's the same thing of of patterns proportions that kind of feel instinctively comfortable for your eye or ear and music mm -hmm. translation um and of course you need um this moment of, of surprise and not fitting into the thing to keep it exciting yeah um, so I guess in both fields, like architect, architecture and music, it's it, it's like that that little notch being trustful or, or being trusted in in a form that you know, and then being excited by the things you don't expect. Mm -hmm. So 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 you get a kind of an comfort and also kind of something pushing you like like of course like being too whatever it's it's the yeah it's the element of comfort and the element of of uh surprise excitement. yeah surprise excitement or or even discomfort of as, as every absolutely surprise must not be a positive surprise not even in a song yeah i uh i you know every people say that uh there's there's no such thing as a as a as a new story right so if, if people like a story it's essentially a retelling of the same story that we've been telling over and over again right like a three act m movie or 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 book or play or something these are all these stories are all essentially the same being about love and power and 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 whatnot and i think of music in this way also sort of like retelling the same story over and over again but in in uh just in, in different ways with exciting new uh, twists and elements or names of your characters, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's like the small difference between story and narrative. Mm -hmm. It's just like the, the stories and topics are always the same because... Because we're humans? <laughs> there are just, yeah. And, and if you boil them down to, they are coming to this um, um, love, power, and all those really basic questions. Uh, uh, anxiety, you know, that kind of basic feelings, um, and then it's just putting them in, into new covers, mm -hmm. like, like into new notes, and and giving and just moving the spot of light a bit to a different point on this giant stories, just to get out and not maybe a fresh or new angle, but 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 a different angle or your personal angle. That's yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really just about injecting enough of yourself into it um, to make it uh, just even appear different because, yeah. you know, ev uh, we're, we're all individuals. And so we're all sort of you can use this fanciful notion of the snowflake, right? We're all like yeah. unique in this way. And I think if you can sort of sprinkle enough of that into uh into your work it doesn't matter if you're a if you're a an author or a songwriter or an architect then then it's got that uh that uniqueness that even though you're retelling the same story you're building the same house it's now different yeah that's definitely like that and even and even repetition is a good thing i mean it, there's nothing wrong about it because it's if you're doing something over and over you're getting automatically usually better in it because you're getting deeper into it yeah it's, it's like the same thing I, I wouldn't start to write myself some whatever metal songs or something because I, I couldn't open up too wide and i couldn't get good in it so in, in, instead i try to get deeper into the things you're good at i think i'm interested in at least maybe right. i'm even good in it um <laughs> And, and that's the same with you. So if you're topping your songwriting, it doesn't matter if it's more guitar driven or whatever song, um, but it's just getting deeper into the songwriting. songwriting in songwriting. So it's the same maybe for me with whatever producing or, or um, especially making beats or something. Which is yeah, I think it's like getting deeper in, in into the structure of a beat. Right. 
which sounds easy, like everyone is whatever referring to floor to the floor beats as kind of easy. Um, and I'm totally disagreeing. It's like in, in the simple form, the the differences between a good and a not so good four beat are rather small. So to have a really nice, good flowing four beat, yeah, uh, you need to get really deep in in in, in into the idea how the bass drum and, and and how your speakers and how everything works in it to get a nice flow which is not super technical but also kind of emotional, which sounds maybe stupid to a lot of people that I refer to a four beat, four to the floor bass drum as simple. It's just the bass drum and just the four to the floor thing as a kind of emotional thing. It's maybe, maybe sure. crazy. But it's, you um, know, it's the magic that happens in between all of that, right? All the, the you've got what, 120, well, you have even more, but you know, 64th notes, 120, eighth notes that yeah, you can but, fit but between when, when, when groove comes and i'm simply just talking about just the bass drum and the four to the floor sure it's just a pure metric one sound bass drum thing and it, and it makes a super to me it makes a super difference if it's a nice one or not of course yeah yeah, yeah. i see what you mean so, mm -hmm. and, and and the difference between a nice one and a not so nice one is like for a common listener or something uh, it's, it's not a huge difference but, but that's something like i said like being going deep into it is to to find and even be able to recognize and feel those differences what's fascinating for me about this boom 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 yeah and the other boom 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 i think i think it's actually stupid. the same i guess with vocalist or guitarist which i always thought to me it's like stupidness or i thought for a long time if i start to talk about their pickups and and know yeah. that there were humbucker or something vc90 i don't know and I thought, like, okay, they're really talking bull, or they're just making fun of me. It's it's some of an inside joke I don't get between guitarists. It's like, ah, uh, look at this stupid electric idiot. <laughs> we yeah. need to some magic tricks we we heard about on whatever forums, and um, it's not really a thing. But it's the same with with singers too. So so the more they are, I think themselves, and 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 so they get deeper and deeper, and even closer to to their identity as singer. Yeah, I think um, the producer Max Martin said it best when he said that he loves hearing a fantastic singer sing a very simple vocal line because they know how to turn something simple into magic. And it's, yep. a, it's a kind of, um, I think, subtlety and nuance that even if your average listener can't pick it up, who doesn't know a thing about singing or doesn't know a thing about programming bass drums, they recognize that there is something special and unique about what it is that they're hearing, even if they can't recognize it or explain it. Yep, because this kind of deepness translates instinctively. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's something what I always liked about whatever techno music, that kind of small differences that somehow translate on a dance floor. Yeah. It might sound super stupid, but I grew up with it, so it's my kind of being socialized into music as active guy making music. So yeah, it's always that kind of what, what is that magic that makes this four beat flow to me special or not. And then it's really like super small nuances that I sometimes can put technically or something. It's the same what we had with um, mastering. You put it on, on the last thing with the empathic mastering thing. It's like a thing. It's like once I got whatever the, the kind of a technical based master, which is technically OK, like like on terms of technique, it, then it comes to a kind of an aesthetical idea of it or, or something. And, and that's not technical at all. So that's like the small nuances that are not describable by numbers. I guess technically they might be describable, of course, if you start really measuring it out, you get sure what, what I guess we had it with openness or something. Yeah. On something, like and then, and in the end, it turned out that that this openness is everything but not openness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like technically really taking out every cliche you think about openness. It's like whatever on the stereo field, you take up the highest a little bit, blah blah blah. And it's, it was actually a bit of the opposite of it. It's like really putting a bit more density on the outside and, and interesting really a bit of bass, which made it. I think open and reduce high end too. 
and and that's something that to me still maybe i'm not professionally enough in it whatever uh, that for me doesn't feel logic but that's something that i can feel while i'm doing it mm -hmm. and without thinking that i do s stuff on purpose just by trying out things and and watch how they feel and yeah. what i think what i think or what i think that you could mean by by the term openness yeah or something because we know each other kind of long so i get in all the time i got an idea what what openness might mean if you say openness it was funny because after I said that, uh, we're actually discussing the uh, the mastering process of the May song Gravity, and uh, you know Christian and I have been doing this now for t twelve or thirteen years, and feel like we've got this sort of pretty good understanding in terms of like uh, expectations of how of the kind of sound that he produces when it comes to his mastering, and him uh, knowing kind of what kind of sounds I personally like and what I'm, you know, what I'm going for, which I think is really, really important uh, when you uh, have a relationship with, uh, well, I mean, anybody that you work with, it's, it's, it's always beneficial to have uh, uh, an understanding of between, between the, the parties involved. Um, but uh, now you're doing this sort of uh, em empathic mastering thing where you're, this is what you call it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how how do you define that? Um, it's it's like I got an. It's not like I'm defining it or something. It it, it just popped up as a term actually when I was mastering um, um, the upcoming Tuskeloda release. They've also mastered the recently released EP, and I'm, I'm usually communicating just with one of the band members. So they got a third one in I've never met, who was in the band in the past or something and then was out of the band for ages so i've never met him personally so when i did the the first ep like whatever it was called friesland ultras or something so so i sent over the masters and and the guy i was talking to i i knew what kind of sound image like general sound image um, um he likes when it comes to mastering so of course in mastering i got just this stereo track or even or sometimes stems or something but i'm not Part of the sound design in that point um so so i know what he likes so kind of my mastering is made for him mm -hmm. like i know he got a bit of pension for for a bit too much of 4k for my personal taste or something right that that then the technical thing of it so this third guy um then came back to the guy i'm talking to and and delivered some messages for me so he wasn't happy with some tracks how they um, um, were mastered because he produced them. Um, and then the next EP came up. I mastered them, and the guy I'm talking to wasn't pleased. He was like, "Oh, well, yeah, yeah, we need to talk about it. Wait over the weekend." And after the weekend, he was like, "Okay, this third guy thinks they are perfect." <laughs> and he was like, "Oh, okay, interested." So from the process of the first EP, I, I just got an idea of what his um, right. and a person I've never met, how the, his idea of a mastering image, which sounds super weird to people, I guess, yeah, um, um, should be how they should feel a bit or something. Um, and, and so I came up with, okay, that was kind of an empathic mastering process because because I'm mastering in the, for for the ears of someone I've never talked to, I've never have any idea what what his yeah. intentions are or what his personal taste is, how he's on what kind of speakers he's listening to his music or whatever. Um, and, and that was a point where I realized like, okay, I can somehow attach to this micro feel of images of people, even if I don't talk to them sometimes, yeah. just, just getting out of the feedbacks is they give to me. Um, so I came up because, because it sounds like a paradox idea <laughs> of a super technical process of like mastering. It might be a bit like quantum physics or something when, I think it is super scientific thing. And then you got this quantum idea, which is halfway random. Yep. And, and then it gets super spiritual in a way. <laughs> yeah. And same, I guess, with the mastering. So it, it, at some point, no one's ears are f so fine and, and technically perfectly trained. And, and sure. your brain is not so clearly adjusted and even calibrated like every day that, that you can do mastering in the same quality every day um 
so there's always this thing of getting your mood or or your idea of the mood of the one you're doing it doing it for into it yeah i guess we usually also have that kind of you send it a mixed version of the track or something and and then we are talking a bit about aesthetics usually always yeah like 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 not as a main topic or something but but under but underlined it's like we had in that zone obviously that i was referring to Bjork army of me and, yeah and, and and then you came up with this uh, a 90s idea and i guess we talked about tattoo didn't we yeah yeah we did yeah, actually yeah. that's funny yeah yeah and and other thing and and, and and then you got an idea of of, of what what kind of mood vibe and something is in the track i don't know what i'm picking up there too but it's kind of that yeah i think i'm gonna establish it because it's it's a nice hashtag maybe it's a good hashtag, <laughs> it's a good hashtag. <laughs> um but yeah i get i i the to finish the thought that i lost <laughs> a minute ago was that you know even though we've been working together for so long and we do have such a good understanding between one another uh mastering can be such a uh, such a vague uh and subjective thing that when i'm telling you hey can you make x or y a bit more open even i realized after i said that i was like that is not very helpful <laughs> that's not a helpful description <laughs> but it actually is but, but you had is. but first you had to understand what i meant by open like you had to go and think about it yeah i had to go and think about it and and kind of translate to it right because I'm, I'm, I'm totally agreeing that it felt after so like the next step of mastering whatever the next evaluation or something it felt more open even of course it even felt to me more open okay although i know technically there's nothing in it that really is technically open it up interesting it's but it's it feels more open yeah and it does it absolutely feels more open it does so <laughs> i guess it's measurable with a lot of technical equipment um but I don't know if it's creatable just by technical ideas. That's right. No, that's a that's a that's a good way of looking at it. And I think that if if you get maybe too technical in terms of something like mastering, it's it's uh, kind of futile because every mix is going to be different and every artist's expectations and desires are going to be different. So um, there's no way to be like, okay, I should always, you know. Uh, compress this frequency band this no. much you know right it's, it's futile no, that, uh, no there's nothing to it I, I got some cliches some frequent frequencies i don't like that much or something like that it seems to be that that a lot of people don't like them that much too it yeah is, it's kind of random that people point out to that specific kind of frequency ranges and, and want me to put them up again a bit or something it's rather random rather seldom actually yeah and, it's like mastering is something you can analyze pretty well in mm -hmm. a way in a technical term. Okay. But I don't think that it's kind of a formalistic, predictable thing. Right. So you can put a lot of technical analysis on it, whatever, loudness, all that, and, and even like what, what's the point um, with transients and how are they are done and, and treated and blah, blah, blah. But it's not something you can put off a recipe for a good mastering for everything or something. Right. It's, I guess it's the same with song. With songwriting, it's the same too. It's like a very simple song can be super emotional, powerful. Yeah. So it, it, and and you can analyze it and look at it like, oh my god, it's it's a simple, simple chords, even not no inversions, no coloring tones, no sevens, nines, six weirdness, nothing, yeah. nothing weird in gliding, building up tones, blah blah blah, no suspended chords, no augmented diminished stuff, nothing. It's super plain. And, and then you think, yeah, it's, yeah, okay, that's an analysis of it, but it's still got, it's still got the spirit of it. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing, though, is is uh, <laughs> retaining retaining the spirit. <laughs> hey, all right. I think that should be the uh, the 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 theme of this discussion is is retaining the spirit. It is. All right. It's about this. No matter how good we are, there's still a sparkle of soul in everything. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I love about it. I love soul. I love soul, too. Soul music. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we, man, we have been at this for 
of wow well over two hours look at that wow. that flew by well I'm, I'm i'm pretty impressed by it i should listen to it on double speed next time yeah that would be <laughs> that, that's smart because then then it only takes up an hour of your time yeah that's okay all that's right like listening to podcasts i can speed it up yeah <laughs> All right. Well, uh, before I let you go, is there anything you want to promote? You said you've got uh, your your second Wiesenberg album. That is that yeah, done? Yeah, yeah. I've got a Wiesenberg album called Counterclockwise coming out pretty soon. I don't have the exact date from the label up to now, but it's finished. The artwork is finished. Everything's finished. Um. Yeah, that's that's my own personal thing coming up, and then the rest is we are still working on other stuff. So it's nothing super precise to promote at the moment and i'm not good at self-marketing at all <laughs> all right well uh i will i will at least put all of your the links to your uh spotify and social media yeah, in the cool. uh, description of the uh, uh video here and i uh, just want to thank you again for uh taking the time to sit down yeah. and talk with me it was a pleasure uh I for all of you ever talk to ours well we should do this again sometime definitely <laughs> we will find some halfway different topics to shine a light on i guess i guess there's a lot about artistry and performance i just guess i think with the surface with, of a lot of little points that are interesting in there yeah with with uh with two hours you're just scratching the surface i'm sure we could have gone on for another two or three or four until our voices well, gave out actually we dedicated our lives to that bull so yeah <laughs> it would be kind of depressing if we would have done completely in two hours yeah don't feel bad about myself <laughs> <laughs> all right well everybody thank you so much for watching christian again thank you for being a part of this and uh, be sure to like this video be sure to subscribe and uh take care see you all next time see you bye thank you